Photoshop has a number of different ways to add creative blurs or selective focus to your image. So here in Bridge, I'll use the context sensitive menus, right mouse click on Windows or control click on Mac, and then choose place in Photoshop. That will open the document and convert that background into a smart object. So now I can add my filter in a non-destructive manner. Under the filter menu, I'll select blur, and then we can choose any one of these first three blurs. They will all display the same dialogue. So I'll go ahead and start with tilt shift, but you can see over here on the right, I have the tilt shift, the iris blur, and the field blur options. Now the tilt shift blur, the center pin I can click on and then drag in order to reposition it. Outside of the center pin, we have this dial where I can dial in or dial out the amount of blur. And if you notice on the right hand side in the panel, I'm moving the blur slider with this dial. So obviously either one of them will work. I can use the slider here or I can use the dial on the on-screen controls. All right, a little bit further away, we have our first solid white line. The distance between the pin and this line there will be no blur applied whatsoever. Then between the first line and the dotted line, that's the fade range. That's where Photoshop starts adding the amount of blur. So it adds a little bit and then more and more as it moves away. By the time it gets to the dotted line, the blur is applied at its full strength. We can reposition these independently. So I can move the solid line and I can also move the dotted line. And of course we can move them on either side of the pin. I can also position my cursor on top of the white dot if I want to rotate the angle here. But one thing to know is if these dots are really close to the center, it becomes kind of hard to control how you're rotating it. So a nice feature that you might not know about is if you click and hold down your mouse anywhere in between the dotted line and the solid line, you can then rotate here and you can see I can rotate much more smoothly if I drag further away from that center point. But if you simply click anywhere out here in between these two lines, you'll actually add a second tilt shift blur. So if you don't want that, you can just tap the delete key in order to remove it. And then to access the original one, we just need to click on the pin icon. Over in the palette, we also have an option for distortion. So let me just move this up a little bit so that we can see the distortion here in the foreground. If I add 100%, you can see that the distortion moves in one direction. If I go negative, it's going to go in the other direction. And by default, the distortion is only being applied in the foreground, but I can turn on the symmetric distortion, in which case I will also get distortion here in the background. Now I know that sounds a little weird to have a foreground or background. You can always just think of it as one side or the other of the tilt shift. And of course, if I don't want any distortion, we can just set that back to zero and turn off the symmetric distortion. So that's the way that you achieve a tilt shift blur in Photoshop. I'm going to uncheck that and then I will click where it says iris blur. That's going to toggle on the iris blur. Again, we have the same pin in the center, so I can reposition the iris blur. I can increase or decrease the amount of the blur by using the on-screen controls, or we can use the slider over in the panel. And I can increase or decrease the size of the blur by positioning my cursor anywhere on top of the white outline there and just dragging a larger circle. If I wanted to change this from a circle to a more square area, I can click on the square here and then start dragging out. You can see how it becomes more of a rectangle. I can also rotate this by positioning my cursor over one of the smaller squares and then clicking and dragging. And then the fade range in this blur happens between the white dot and the outer solid line. So there's no blur happening between the center point or the pin and the first initial white dot. All of the blur is happening between the white dot and the white line. So let me reposition this in the center of my image for a moment and we'll make this a little bit larger so that we can see what happens when I move the white circles in towards the center. So now the blur is going to start much more quickly. In fact, we'll add a bigger blur to make sure that we can see that. So now the blur will start right here 
See, as I move it out, we can control exactly where that blur starts and where it ends. But there might be some times when you want to move each one of these independently. If you hold down the Option key, you'll notice that I can click and drag. That would be the Alt key on Windows. And then I can reposition each one of these independently. Go ahead and scoot that over. And that's how you would create your iris blur. Of course, you can always add a secondary blur by just positioning your cursor outside of the initial blur and clicking to set down another pin. I'll tap the Delete key to remove that. And we'll also delete this one. And then we'll move over to the Field Blur. I'll click where it says Field Blur in the Blur Tools area. And the thing about this blur is that it's meant to be used in combination with other blurs. My concern is that people come in here, it's the first blur on the list, they look, they say, hmm, it adds a blur, and then they click away and they never use it again. But if I set this blur in the upper left, and then I click again, and I reduce the amount of blur on this field blur, and then we add another one up here, and we increase the effect, maybe we add another one down here, and we decrease the effect, you can see that every single pin that I set down can have its own amount of blur. And if I hold down the M key, we can actually see the mask that Photoshop's creating. So here in the center, because this blur is set to none, we've got the mask at black. And then it's going to gradiate out in between all of the other pins. So anytime that I want to change the amount of blur, you can see that the mask is dynamically changing. If I change position, we can watch it update. And if I click on a different pin and then change the amount of blur, we can watch that update as well. If I let go of the M key, then we'll be returned from the mask to the preview of the image. If I tap the P key, that toggles on and off the preview. And if I hold down the H key, that will hide the interface. And if I release the H key, we can see the interface again. So all three of those shortcuts, the M for mask and the H to hide and show and the P for preview, those actually work in all three of the different blurs. And of course, you can use these blurs in combination with one another. So I could also select to add an iris blur and use the disclosure triangle there and access those options. Now, it's a little hard to tell that they're working in combination here, but if I were to position this maybe somewhere else in the image and then tap the M key, we can see that this mask is being added to the mask below it. I'll tap the Delete key just to delete that, and then I'll click the OK in order to apply that filter. Because we were working on the Smart Object, of course, we have the option here to change those attributes at any time by double clicking on Blur Gallery. We could also go in and mask this out with the Smart Filter Mask to paint in and out this effect. So there you are, three non-destructive ways to add selective focus to your photograph in order to help you lead the viewer's eye where you want it to go.